Don't you just love how the spiritual journey unfolds before you and you discover new things? Today's guest, Chance Garten from Innerverse Podcast, you might remember our last episode, he's back and he's here to talk to us about sound vibrational healing, which I have actually experienced. It's very powerful. It's so amazing how our energy bodies are like the rings on a tree and how trauma can get stuck inside those rings and we can actually loosen it up and release it through vibrational sound healing. So tune in and join us and find out more about Chance's new venture. You're invited, delighted to discover who you are. Anything is possible if you believe. So join us on this beautiful journey. Before we start this episode, I, Carrie Hummingbird, and I, Akeem Sami, want you to know that you are invited. You're invited to, to join, join Soul Nectar, Nectar Tribe. Tribe. If you like what you hear on Soul Nectar Show, you will love being in person with us in Soul Nectar Tribe. We invite you to check it out. First 30 days is free. Right now, go to carryhummingbird.com, K-E-R-R-I, hummingbird.com, forward slash membership, and sign up. We'll We'll see see you you at at our our next next tribe gathering. gathering. And now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Soul Nectar Show, that show where we talk about all things essence, where we gather around the campfire and we share our stories to connection to that which is bigger than us, the great mystery beyond the veil, to those synchronistic moments that lead us inexorably like little breadcrumbs to an understanding of ourselves that's deeper and more expansive and more cool and perplexing and fantastic. And we have these amazing experiences along the way when we start opening up to the great mystery. And I love to share those uh, stories with you. I'm your host, Carrie Hummingbird. I uh, love these conversations. And I especially love it when I've already interviewed somebody on my podcast. And then sometime later, we get another chance at another conversation. And today is definitely one of those opportunities because I have the infamous Chance Garten of the Interverse podcast on my show again today. Welcome, Chance. Hey, what's up, Carrie? Good to see you again. Uh, how uh, did I become infamous? I'm curious. <laughs> I'm an Your outlaw. episode was like very popular for a good long time. And, uh, you know, definitely people enjoyed our conversation that was like just, you know, all over the place and fantastic and down rabbit trails. And my audience tends to like those things. And you're very good at that. So I'm kind of excited to hear. I know you've made a lot of changes since we last had you on the show. And I, I will put a link to the uh, first episode for anybody that wants to go back and check that out. But um, so tell me more, like, tell me what's been going on in your world. Cause you, anybody that watched the last episode, if you're watching it, you can see like Chance's whole background is different. He's got like this clean minimalist uh, thing happening. And he's like, he just behind the camera, just behind the (laughs) camera, only behind the camera. Maybe, maybe more chaotic over there. (laughs) The chaos is now sequestered off screen, but you know, it's just fun because you have like a different vibe and now you have your staff, your staff is right there. Almost dropped. Almost dropped. It's like very cool. It's like the biggest crystal I've ever seen. I mean, it's humongous. Oh, I've got bigger crystals than this. But it's all like on a staff (laughs) like that and it's all, you know, you've got it all. Yeah. It's on bamboo. Sickness yeah, it's on bamboo light. and yeah, like walk around with your staff. I love it. So how did you, what's the evolution process here? Like since the last time we talked to you, I think it's been over a year, hasn't it? Yeah, I think so. I believe we did this probably in around February or January last year, although the episode came out many months later because you're good at being ahead of the game, which I admire. <laughs> I do my best. <laughs> I tend to like put them out within a few days of when I do them, but I'm putting out a lot of shows. Uh, So since we last talked, so much has happened. Really, that was a crucial, pivotal time for me because I was coming into a deeper understanding of source and what is reality and existence in um, context of what is artificial, what is imaginary, 
And we had a really good conversation about that and talked about, you know, the ideas behind the creator or Jehovah as being the self-existing life force energy that is inherent in all things. And getting that framework really helped me build out even further what I was here to do. Like at the time that we discussed all those things, it was still a point in my life where I hadn't yet stepped fully into my role doing, I guess we'd call like shamanic healing practices. And I'd had experience in a, I don't know, professional is not the right word, but in a non-professional way, experimental way, just trying to help way for many years. I had a, always had an aptitude for Reiki type stuff, energy healing, without any particular training in that. It's sort of, well, crystals like this actually sort of unlocked it for me. So since we last talked, I discovered a book. I think I may have already read the book at that point, but I was still researching perhaps. I, but I found this book, Tuning the Human Biofield. Yeah. By Eileen Day McCusick. And she's also got a newer book called Electric Body, Electric Health. Really incredible, new perspectives, very scientifically grounded, but also fully invested in the woo, <laughs> but explaining the woo in a way that we can actually understand materially, materially. So tuning the human biofield gave me a roadmap or a, what you call an anatomy of our aura, of the energy field that surrounds our body. And it turns out that this energy field has a common structure and a similarity between person to person in terms of what types of energies are where. Uh, very related to the chakra system. We can get more into this in depth as we go. But I, I discovered this biofield anatomy and something inside me, you know what it's like whenever, I mean, I come across a million different modalities and practices and things, and some of them are interesting. Some of them I want to dabble with, but every once in a while, something comes across your, your board and you're like, ding, 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 this is the thing, right? Try this, go that way. So I did. And I spent a lot of time experimenting with the tuning forks with people in person and trying out the methods that were described by Eileen in her book and experimenting and kind of making them my own. And she also offers courses at the Biofield Tuning Store, I think is where it's at. I highly recommend people just look into her work. You can get full on training to do this type of thing for yourself and for others. But actually, I was able to develop my own version of this by reading her book and experimenting. And what's really cool about it is it works remotely. And we'll talk yeah. about that too and why, why it works remotely. But so all that happened. Uh, I began doing a lot more podcasts in the last year too. I found the app Telegram, which is a new form of social media, newer. It's probably been around a few years. But for whatever reason, when I started a group there, a community started to form and really explode and blossom. So now we got a group chat there for my show that's probably at around 500 people. And that is very active and a lot of extremely wise people came into my life and I have a, a deep and meaningful relationship with so many of them now, like a daily friendship connection and sharing information and answering questions for each other. So that really helped a lot. And I realized I wanted to do something that brought more of that community uh, energy to the fore and put some people on stage and in a spotlight that maybe aren't doing this type of thing yet, but are very wise and very knowledgeable and very loving and awesome people. So I started a second show on top of my main weekly show, Interverse, called Vibe Rant, <laughs> like vibrant, but we vibe and we rant. Oh, that's, that's cool. A, it's really fun. We do that every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Central. On, you can find it on my YouTube channel or my Rockfin channel and, or just watch the replays, but it's an extremely good time. I take voicemails and people send us memes and they call in even. So it's a very, like I usually have a main guest for, the, for that episode, but then within at least an hour, we start taking callers and it kind of explodes and becomes some, you know, totally beyond what you could plan in terms of like the magic and the energy of the conversation. So I started doing that. Um, got connected with some other cool shows, like one called Weaving Spiders Welcome, that is a similar panel type live show on Saturday, night, Saturday nights and have a lot of fun with those guys and gals. So really like my, my <clears throat> connection to a community has, ex has extremely expanded in the last year. And that's been massively helpful. 
But on top of that, as I experimented and played with the tuning fork modality, I started being able to take on client work with that. And that, that has been amazing, super powerful. And I'd love to talk more about it. Yo, yeah, that's great. All that stuff sounds awesome. I'm curious to you about Telegram and all that. I, I haven't figured out how to how that all works. So I have no it's idea. It's really a simple app. It's like um, basically a group chat. It's not it's less complicated than things like Facebook or Instagram. And there's no like profile posturing or likes or other gross type of, you know, currency of attention. It's really more just about one to one communication and connection and no censorship. I have a lot of, I've had a lot of issues with censorship on the mainstream platforms yeah, because, me too. you know, too much, uh, too much truth, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and truth that's not, that's counter to the narrative, right? The mainstream narrative. So, okay. Well, that's cool. I'm going to look into that more. Maybe offline, I'll ask you some questions about it, but it's that's really great that you're getting like so much engagement because, um, I, I definitely am interested in that too. I, you know, I think we all are just thirsting for connection after all that crazy uh, COVID sequestering time. And now people are like, hey, I want to get out and do something different and interesting and not all by myself in my house, you know, and you're offering some opportunities, you know. So uh, tell me more. We about actually had a, a meetup for people, a few people that listen to my show. Oh, and that in person. Yeah, we all met up at a dude's homestead that's not that a couple hours from me. And I think there were like six of us that gathered there for a weekend and romped around in nature. And I helped him clean a chicken coop and we all shared <laughs> meals and gifts with each other. And it was awesome. We got off the screen and into the real. Into the real. I love that. That's fantastic. Yeah, we need more of that for sure. And I think people are opening up to that, like less afraid of traveling and things like that. I think the mask mandate is coming off. At least I, I heard that it was going to come off. Maybe it'll go back on. I don't know. You know, I never wore one. And I'm <laughs> lucky that I'm in an area where the mandates didn't last all that long and then they didn't come back. But oh, you're even so when lucky. They had them, you know, the thing about that is it's not actually law. Mandate is not law, but we don't have to digress into all that. <laughs> another thing I've really done, another thing I've really done a lot of since all this cootie stuff uh, began. Cootie stuff. Yeah, I mean, I use code words because we get on YouTube, you know, and the, the <laughs> like Harry Potter, that, that which shall not be named, that starts with a V. Yeah. I like to call it, I like to call it the cowpoke because uh, the word vaca, V-A-C-C-A, is Latin for cow. You know, they always tell us about herd immunity and all that, but yeah, <laughs> code words have been oh, crucial hilarious. for me. To not get like fully banned off of YouTube, which has been still a useful platform, despite the fact that every two followers I get, I lose one because whatever the algorithm is unsubscribing people to my channel on purpose. But nobody wants to hear me complain about YouTube. I'm sure the creators no, but talk that's about like, that all the time. Yeah, that's so crazy. But yeah, these platforms really are like, it's not really a matter of... Uh, I actually, that's one of the things I was telling you about on that last episode that I was talking about, because I was talking about how like social media companies, I'm pretty sure there's just some person like in, like in their cubicle going, that's not true. And then like, you know, flagging it, you know, <laughs> well, I don't know how they like decide all this. Labor across, overseas that they have oh. dealing with that type of stuff, but it's flagged by algorithms and uh, that are looking for particular words and phrases and then that gets escalated sometimes that just gets automatically canceled if the algorithm decides it's severe enough but other times it gets kicked over to like outsourced companies and you know island nations of asia things like that yeah so hundreds of people crammed into a small building being paid peanut wages to censor american content it's really weird it is weird so how do you, so you're getting, you're actually getting connected with people, which is great that are interested in what you have to offer and are also like contributing their own wisdom. That's exciting. And that they're willing to like share their voices and things like that is exciting too. So how are you, um, I think that, that, that tuning fork stuff that you're looking at might even be, I might even know somebody who does that kind of tuning work here in Austin and I've experienced it and it's actually quite profound to lie there and feel like how the tuning fork goes through your, basically your etheric body and like unclogs clogged energy essentially yeah. is what I would call it. 
it's kind of cool. You lie there and you can actually feel things coming up as the person's working in your field. Yeah. And my favorite is when I get somebody that has already been doing a lot of work on themselves. So they come in with a pretty clear and in flow field already. And then like the, the movement of energy and the stuff, the deep stuff that comes out is huge. It's huge. But at any point or any level, the process is helpful. You know, I like to liken it to, have you ever seen metronomes put into a room together and set off at different times? I have never seen that. There's a really weird thing that happens when you do that. The metronomes eventually, after enough time, all sync up with each other. And they, yeah, even if you start them at different times. Yeah, oh, the that's universe. Cool. Okay, so nature is a self healing, self correcting system. Harmony is the norm, and coherence is what everything's always moving towards. So we've been told by scientism that entropy is the the main law of the universe and everything's degrading and getting worse all the time. But really there's another force at work, which is, you could call it centropy, you could call it levity. I like centropy or syncropy because we are synchronizing with that which is most harmonious innately and automatically. So when it comes to, yeah, the, the, the metronome thing's crazy. They really do. They, you can find videos of this. They actually get in sync with each other. So whenever you bring a coherent, tone into your energy field, your body is a self-tuning instrument as well. And it will actually adapt its tone, the tone song of your DNA and of your cells to the coherent energy of the, you know, the tool that you bring into it or your voice even. Singing can be a, a great way to achieve this for yourself. Yeah, I've been practicing that actually. Um, in my line of shamanic healing, what I've been learning is the Icaro, which is the healing song. And uh, this is from the native people in um, the jungle of Peru, the Shipipo. They sing healing songs in order to convey healing to people. And they'll call in like different medicine allies and things like that. And then they'll sing the song directly into the cells and the tissue of the person that's sitting there and asking this medicine to enter and heal the person. And so I've been practicing this and it's actually quite effective. And and this, my big prayer when I went to the jungle and and um, November in Peru was please open the song up in my heart so that I these melodies can just come right through and I can just sing the words and not be you know I can not be insecure I can just be confident and like just let the music come through me and just put the words to it and focus on the client and it's actually like I'm singing all these amazing songs now it's like wow this is so cool and it's really healing and actually somebody I really care about who was sort of not really open to this kind of thing previously, suddenly was like, yes, um, I will accept your offer of a healing song and some tobacco clearing and stuff. And it was amazing. He could actually feel, he could, and he's, you know, he's not in this work, but he, he could even feel it moving through. So I totally agree with you. And that reminds me of heart math too, because heart math is all about resonance, right? Resonance of our heart fields. And I feel like when you're singing, you're singing from the heart. like your resonance of your congruence of your heart is coming out through your voice. Yeah. Yeah. You're totally right about that. There's really great research through that. And, uh, the biofield is an electromagnetic type of thing. It's actually described by Eileen as bioplasma and how I understand yeah. plasma is not really, mm, it's kind of a misunderstood form of inner of matter or energy because it's really in this like liminal state between matter and energy. Plasma is the flow itself. It is the actual flow of energy that is in a state of excitement beyond gas. So it's not really in one place or another. It is more like the general shape and flow of a field of energy that is in constant motion and potential. That's how I, how I kind of understand plasma. So our Hearts do create this electromagnetic field around our body, but it's also a plasma type of energy. And it, <clears throat> you know, it's got a consistency to how, how shaped it is. Like, actually, <laughs> one thing that I do to, to begin a session that's really interesting, I may be explaining all this out of order, but it's cool. I use dowsing rods, like uh, L rods, and I measure the person's field one chakra at a time and can see which ones are normal sized, larger, too small, 
and then gives me kind of like a diagnosed a diagnostic shortcut to know what to focus on whenever we get into the session. So what would be maybe like a two or three hour process, because there would be a lot of exploratory work with the tuning forks, actually cut out a lot of that and just get straight to the problem areas and strengthening those by doing this like dowsing process that only takes a couple minutes at the beginning. Yeah, that's cool. That's kind of, well, I use a pendulum, I guess as a form of dowsing. You could, you could use a pendulum for that too. Uh, actually, pendulum is useful because it'll show you the direction of the spin of the chakra. So you could also have, there'd be some good information out of that too. Yeah. And you can see like, um, it's interesting what, because I'll test chakras with the pendulum to see like how open they are, how close they are at the beginning of the session. And then if they just hang there, that's just my message. Like you need to work on this one. That's just how my pendulum works for me. It just goes work on this. <laughs> it doesn't yeah, move yeah. at sometimes all. I, you know? I run into sometimes people who have a chakra that just doesn't register with the, with the, um, the dowsing rods, but that doesn't mean that they're like in dire, dire danger or anything. The, our, our energy field and, the configuration of the chakras in terms of how open one is and how active one is or not is something that actually changes day by day, hour by hour, potentially. And that's one of the things that people, myself included, need reminded about because just that you maybe, maybe just because you had a, a, re a recognition that like, wow, I'm really clear and open and everything's good. Or you get a session and everything's like fully aligned and, and firing after that. Well, <laughs> you're, energy field follows your mind. So, you know, if you just go right back into the same thought patterns or behaviors that were harmful to your energy field, then it will re, you know, readjust itself to the old pattern. So that's why like we need to be practicing our grounding and, and balancing work every day. Balance is not like you did it, <laughs> you know, you're balanced, you achieved it. You know, one, you keep balancing. That's the point. Have, it's a continual process. There's not actually an end to it. Yeah, there's no end to it. That's true. But there, you can keep yourself on a constant upward trend if you just keep practicing the tools. That's why I always teach tools because I started realizing with all the healing sessions, they're super helpful, right? And you give people a boost, but then it starts to degrade if they don't practice some kind of way of maintaining that balance or staying self-aware or, you know, tracking things. And it's not like, I mean, stuff's going to come up in life anyway. Like, you know, unexpected things are going to happen. You're going to react to those things and then your system's going to go out of whack again. And then you, you work on it again, but there's like a way that you can kind of keep at least an upward trend so that it doesn't, it doesn't get like really turned around in the wrong direction. Um, by practicing tools, right? Like the grounding and things like that. Self-awareness, clearing your own stuff. Singing is a big one. For Singing. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so in the West, we really are lacking a conceptualization of life force energy. And what our physical form is, is actually a vessel for that. So our ability to stay in a perpetual flow of synchronicity at least that we perceive and derive excitement from because we're actually always within synchronicity, <laughs> but to, you know, be in the flow of exciting synchronicities that feel like a 100% hell yes all the time. Well, that requires that we have as much integrity in our vessel or container for life force energy as possible. And unfortunately in the West, there's been many different versions of, <laughs> I call them messiops, <laughs> like messiah psyops. Basically, like savior programming type ideas. Yeah, where savior programming. Mm -hmm. Savior programming. It is everywhere, and so we've got this wired wiring culturally to believe that our help, our ability. First of all, our energy comes from like coffee, <laughs> right? It has nothing to do with an idea like subtle energy as chi does or something. We're not conceiving of our energy balance sheet for the day. Like, you know, there are are we building up our chi or do we have less chi at the end of the day, right? Like, uh, are we continually running ourselves ragged and our baseline is going lower or are we getting good rest? Are we doing all the things that, you know, eating the right foods, eating clean, getting the sunlight. There's a, and you could actually look at the whole conceptualization of chi as just like voltage electrically. That's what I love about Eileen's book, electric body, electric health. And something I've been studying really deeply 
since getting into her work is the electric universe theory that everything is electric and you can use the concepts of electricity and how it works and even on an engineering level to recognize ways to increase your voltage. But with the messiops thing, we, <laughs> this goes right in hand with the, uh, the ideas of psychic vampirism, which I've also studied a lot and which most people practice unconsciously as a survival mechanism for energy, but it is completely unnecessary for human beings to behave that way once we realize and take responsibility for our energy in a more complete fashion. So when I talk about messiops, I'm talking about how we've been taught that the best people are the ones that are self-sacrificing for others, right? That uh, somebody needs need something of you. So you're giving them your energy in a way you're feeding them. I call it feeding them your light. And we don't actually want to do that because when we feed somebody our light and that person has a leaky vessel and that's why they're lacking light in the first place and lacking the self-awareness. Well, it's like pouring your juice into a, a cup that's got holes in it. So then nobody's got the juice, right? It's a void. It's a null. So really what we want to do is get our vessels in the highest level of integrity as possible. We want to clear up the leaky Swiss cheese holes in our aura from all the, you know, external psychic vampirism that any type of parasite in nature does a puncturing type effect. And this happens energetically or physically, whether it's a mosquito or somebody that, you know, hits you with some kind of aggressive or intimidating thing. And you feel yourself kind of spun out over it. You feel your level of clarity or attention drop a little bit, a surprise sneak attack. That's what I mean by psychic vampirism. So when we get our energy fields and integrity and our vessels whole and not leaking anymore, you know, I like to really focus on the solar plexus for this. I call it the treasure chest. <laughs> sort of that golden <laughs> light, that golden will light, you know, that higher will lives. And I like to live actually more in the solar plexus than even in the heart personally, because it's a little more objective place to be. <laughs> the heart has both flavors. It's got joy and sorrow. I'm not saying don't also localize your consciousness in your heart, but being directed from this treasure chest solar plexus is a very powerful state. And whenever we accumulate a lot of life force energy or chi, and our vessel is very powerful and strong, we keep building ourselves up over and over time, then instead of feeding other people our light, we become like a lantern because we have so much of that light of self that we're holding within ourselves that just our very presence illuminates other people. They can see where they are and who they are more clearly, and you don't have to feed them or give them a thing. I'm not saying we don't help others. I'm saying that the best type of way to help other people is the stuff that we can do easily that is not a sacrifice or a loss for us, but that feels amazing and feels huge for them. And that's the thing about sacrifice uh, that we've been you know, confused about for a long time. We've been taught all these things like Abraham's got to sacrifice his firstborn son, Isaac, or whatever. But really the things we want to sacrifice and the more powerful to sacrifice are the things about ourselves that need to die or need to be let go of or change rather than giving up that which is best in us or that we love most. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this gets to the heart resonance, the heart math institute teachings, because they're like saying that when you get into your own heart, into your own vibe, you're by staying in that place and focusing your attention in your heart and your and your own love, that it actually starts to um, bring everybody else into harmony with that coherence with that heart coherence and that's you know that's just by staying in yourself that's just by loving on yourself and staying in yourself and definitely as a healer I've had to learn that lesson you were talking about of not like giving my energy over to other people so I mean if I was doing that today with the number of healings that I have all day long like there's no way I could keep doing my healings if I was like pouring out my energy like every single time to different people right so it's like having to learn how to ground and center and get really full myself and then and then not be like doing the healing but more like just allowing the healing to move through me like universal energy moving through me replenishing me at the same time and then also helping everybody else that i'm helping so that they're just opening up to their actual energy i mean because the it's already there it's just that 
you know, nothing wakes up unless you pay attention to it. Like if you ignore it, it's just sort of like dormant. But as you start to pay attention to it, it does wake up. And you said something else, which is really like the Swiss cheese energy body. That was definitely one of the first things like I learned at energy medicine school. They were like, everybody, like what, when you're not eating really well and, and you're not taking care of yourself and all, and you have these addictions and habits and things like that, your energy feels looks like Swiss cheese. And so you have to, in order to hold more energy, you have to be able to fill up your cup, like, and, and sort of like patch up the holes. Like you've got to like create a cohesive auric field that can hold more energy. And that is, um, you know, that's like that vessel that doesn't have a bunch of holes where all the water is leaking out, but you, you're holding the energy longer. And that's the other reason why people, you know, it's like you get a healing that's great, you know, and it fills up your cup momentarily. But then if you've got a bunch of holes in your field, it's going to leak out. You can't sustain it. But as you build your, with practice, you build your auric field and you make it strong, you can hold more and more and more energy. And that's what gets you that forward momentum I was talking about like that that incline like you're always ascending you're always learning you're always growing also that continual release process you were talking about but you know one thing i want to ask you about because i have definitely seen this and and noticed it and this is not like going to be a rant against mary jane okay but <clears throat> that particular plant medicine it, it does introduce a lot of holes in people's auric fields Oh yeah, I it's, learned this myself. It's a huge Actually, energy leak. Talked, uh, I've, you know, my relationship to it has changed completely. It's just one of those medicines that is like a doorway for like awakening your consciousness. She's very seductive. She lures you down the path, but at some point you have to realize that she's taking more than she's giving, and it's like, okay, you're now. I need to have a boundary with you. Like now, I need to have my auric field. And there's other medicines that come in and help you like rebuild your auric field and be very strong, including just like contemplation and things like that and breath work. But, you know, everything psychoactive, psychedelic has this effect that you're describing with Mary Jane. But I want to, you know what, I've come to think about it in terms of like a, a balanced perspective that, you know, uh, explains why it has its use as a medicine, but also why continual abuse will suggest to you to disuse it. <laughs> I look at it like, you know, when we do abstain from that type of behavior, abstain from addiction or our needy behavior in general, and we really build ourselves up, uh, there is a, a natural mechanism and rhythm and flow in, in universe of charge and discharge. And I believe that the reason why whenever your tolerance is low or you haven't done it, that first experience or the first one in a long time can be so mystical, so magical, so mind expanding, so heart uplifting, you know, mind blowing. <laughs> I believe it's because you actually are kind of, you know, poking a hole in your field and there's this balloon deflating effect to a degree, but that doesn't mean that it's a, that that is in and of itself. It's not fatal. It's not bad necessarily. One opening is easy to then close up again. And there is a, it's actually natural. And if you do that, like with awareness and with intention, then that, ah, exhale of letting out some of that chi that you've built up through the use of a plant medicine, like cannabis or any of the psychedelics can be like just humongous. And you'll, you can ride on the integration of the insights that you receive in that exhale for a long time, but continue use, continued abuse, then it's like you've got 10 or 12 or however many holes. And that takes more work to patch it up. And you're really chasing a dragon too, because you're not getting that same big earth expanding, amazing experience, right? Uh, the repeated use of it. It's kind of like just a habit now. Yeah, it has to be intentional. I mean, I think that's the main thing that many people miss about it is that it becomes a, a like you said an addiction or a habit instead of an, like an intentional use like i'm gonna be doing this to clear this whole like for example when i did uh love is fierce book and i was healing the mother wound whenever i would do ceremony it would be like okay i am going to heal this next piece of the mother wound so i'm open to receive the information the insights the guidance to clear ancestral patterning around it from my body so i want some body healing and so like when the when the intention is healing 
and the intention is insight and spiritual growth, like towards a purpose, then what happens is that you, you, that the consciousness of that plant really comes in and does lots and lots of work with you at like a really fine level. And then it can take a little while to integrate that. So you need to honor like the integration period. Like you can't be like pouring some more in, you know, you've got to like let yourself integrate however long it takes you to integrate because everybody's different. Some people can integrate it like that. Some people need like years, you know, so it's just, there's nothing wrong with any of it. I mean, it's just kind of like take your time, but it's, it's the intention. Cause I remember when I was a kid and I was playing with Mary Jane quite a bit, my intention was to have fun. <laughs> that was my intention. There's nothing wrong with that intention. Exactly. Except that at some point it's not, at some point you have to recognize is it dragging you down into depression like symptoms you know like where you're like your energy is really low really vibing low because you got so many holes in your auric field and all of these like sort of like congruent energies in the universe that are vibing at that same low level are like finding their way into your auric field and taking up residence now you're like a walking parasite factory so i think that the opening that cannabis creates is definitely in the upper chakra regions. Uh, so probably in more like a third eye or throat somewhere around in the head, you know, cause you feel it. It's a head change. They call it. I think that uh, people with uh, a weakened energy field with problems with their health, where their, their container for energy, you know, they're, they're weak in the lower areas. They don't have a lot filling up their vessel. The uh, cannabis can, it has a particular baseline. What I'm trying to say is it has a particular baseline vibratory uh, rate, you know, it's at a certain frequency. And if you're below that frequency and you use it even rather habitually, it tends to bring you up to its level. But if you are above that, some crown cosmic level area, it might bring you down to its level. So that's something to keep in mind too. It has great use medicinally for people that are are very weakened and very ill, especially physical problems, but it does, you know, there becomes a point where we outgrow the need for regular use of any of that stuff. Yeah, because you get tools and you get, you learn how to um, but I, get I into the dream years. state without <laughs> it, but you can learn how to be, you can learn how to, your whole life can be the dream state without that medicine. You know, I've had it where now, you know, I've had experiences over the last few years where it's like, Am I on medicine? Because I feel normal. Like, you know, it's like nothing happening, really. It's just kind of hanging out like, okay, it's not, this is just what I always feel like. You know, you know what's so. really been enjoyable for me lately? And to go back to all the community stuff that's been a part of my world is, and I realized that this is what drew me to podcasting too. A friend at this meetup, he mentioned the intoxication of fellowship. Yeah. And I was like, that's exactly what it is because after a really high vibing conversation where you get in sync with somebody and you're able to express things that you otherwise couldn't even easily think about until you got into that back and forth exchange and you're hearing yourself talk and you're like, wow, that's what I think. And you're de diving deeper into who you are and realizing who you are more clearly because of the conversation. That is to me the most attractive form of intoxication because it does feel like <laughs> medicine in that time. And intoxication is just a word. It doesn't mean, you know, that you're, you're effed up on it, <laughs> but it is a, it's, it's a real thing. And, and I think that's what we should be seeking most and foremost right now, because all the powers that shouldn't be have been doing their best to make us scared of that type of connection and mediate it through a screen. And we can achieve a level of that fellowship power through the screens. And I have, and I do regularly, but there's nothing like being around the bonfire. Yeah, being in person and with your drums and everything else, taking a sacred journey together and having conversation, like you said, and being in resonance with each other and connection. So when you're doing your um, your he healing work, like um, through the tuning, what are some like no common things that you're noticing people are going through? Like, do you get insights when you're doing the clearings? Do you get like what this is, or do you just kind of feel blocked energies and then work on healing those? Well, that's so, it's so cool is it's actually a little different almost every time, but 
seems like spirit brings me the type of situation that I'm ready to learn about next every time that something I've never encountered comes up and they build off of each other. Like I remember the first time I ran into a person's field where they had a shocker that just didn't register that was like off, quote unquote. And then after that, the next three people expressed that way. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm meant to be learning about this dynamic and what it means. And then another time, like, what does it mean when a uh, third eye is overcharged where it's like way bigger than it should be and everything else, is, especially below, is weaker and there's these bottlenecks. And so I learned about things uh, step by step and was guided through them synchronistically and it's amazing. But to describe what the process is like, so whenever you would do this in person, you'd have them laid out on a massage table. But because I do these remotely almost all the time, I actually, I still put out the massage table, but I lay out crystals and candles, mostly a bunch of selenite and then like different colored candles representing the chakras. And someone described it to me the other day and I was like, you know what? That is kind of what it looks like. They told me it was like a a voodoo doll, but for good. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. It, and I was like, you know, it kind of is because it's a it's crystals laid out to represent the body. I mean, there's legs and there's arms and there's the whole spine and energy channel there. So what I do at the very beginning of the session, after I've laid all that out, and I make an agreement with the other person, that higher self of our of me and of them is going to guide the process, and that they there's no wrong way for them to experience it. There's no wrong way for me to do it. So when I'm in there, uh, I've become adept at not worrying about if I'm doing it right and just getting into a flow state with it and just doing things. And that's kind of the funky thing about being in touch with source energy. That is also that like, it's a paradox and it's also tricky, uh, is that, and why it requires so much authenticity of intention and purity of intention to do this type of work is that whenever you're tapped into source and whenever you're acting through the, you know, through the origin, you're, you're being original in that sense, it feels like you're making it up as you go. <laughs> yeah, you are making it up as you go. <laughs> but isn't that what source is? Yeah. Source is the pure creative force. It is the imagination. It is the universal imagination. So yeah, of course you are making it up as you go. And so anyone out there that's experimenting in healing arts or of any kind in the energetic domain, and they feel like this imposter syndrome of the fact that they're like, I kind of am just making it up as I go. Don't be afraid of that. Actually embrace that, but just also make sure that your intentions are pure and that you make very clear statements of intent. And even in a contractual sense, like you can ask higher self to do things. You can ask higher self to be in charge of stuff. You can ask spirit guides and spirit team and ancestors and guides and guardians to do to come into the space. You can exclude things that you don't want in the space. You have full autonomy of all this stuff, but you got to be clear about it. So if you're making it up as you go, be very clear, you know, be very specific in your wishes, right? So I get the table lined up and I, I make this agreement with them that higher self is in charge and start with the dowsing and some grounding. But as I'm sweeping Okay, so maybe I got to describe what the biofield anatomy is like a little bit to go through this. But as you move a fork that has been struck through the space around about six feet off the body to the left and right that their aura would be in, the fork will react in different ways. And you have to really rely on intuition. And this takes a little bit of practice. And it's going to be different for everyone depending on you know, their astrological chart, for example. Like, where's your Neptune? How do psychic abilities manifest for you? In particular, are you somebody that visualizes things psychically? Are you more of a feeling level, clairsentient? Are you more of a idea just pops into your head and in terms of words or narrative? Like it helps, this process really helped me get into alignment with like how my particular style of psychic abilities work, which is that <laughs> it pops into my head, the idea of what it is in a very clear idea. Uh, I just know but I don't get to know how I know. And I don't necessarily get to know why I know. <laughs> <But Yeah>. with, <laughs> that's just how it is for me. But with the, the biofield anatomy, what makes it such a useful modality for me in, in, in my life is, and with that style of psychic ability is that there's actually a consistency and it's almost mechanical and predictable what different places in the field are like. So for example, like hanging out around the right hip or off the body at that height level going off to the right. This is where the energy of 
feeling like you're overdoing it, over pushing yourself too far, doing too much. It, it congregates around the right hip or uh, the left, the left foot, for example. This has to do with uh, things that we have trouble letting go of, that things we need to move away from, but we don't know how or we can't. And there's some difference depending on if the energy is in front or in back as well, but there's a consistency in every region of this biofield has a, has a meaning to it. It's part of our emotional body and it contains our old traumas and past wounding. And in fact, it's like the rings of a tree. So if there was a particular, like say on the solar plexus level, there was energy that was really off balance and it was far off to the left. And it was like, say three feet away from the body. And the person was 30 years old then I would be able to diagnose that when I hit that pocket of energy, that sometime around the age of 15, that they had had some type of grief over lack of support from their mother. Because also the mother, father, parental, maternal, and ancestral energies are contained in this field and have a place as well. So like the rings of a tree, where the energy is at tells you when it happened. So like at the edge of the field is around birth, and right next to the body is recent time. So halfway through the field is like halfway through their life, if you know how old they are. So I get to have the insight or the psychic bing that pops into my head and it's like, here, stop here. And sometimes that's because I hear the fork kind of make a different sound or it feels like it's running out of tone faster. I call that like the, the field is thirsty whenever I hit the fork and it just runs out really quick in a certain spot. And then I'll just play the fork repeatedly in that spot until it maintains its vibration longer. But it's sort of like a click and drag method. I sweep it through the field and maybe I hit a spot. Maybe I let it hang out there for a while. And then I hit it again. And when I feel like it's clear again, then I'm pulling that knot or tangle of stagnated energy back towards the central channel column of the body and reintegrating it to their main energy field where it can then circulate and come into awareness. And sometimes that constitutes the person having the feelings. Like they might tell me on the table all of a sudden, like, hey, I'm feeling a lot of like stiffness in my area below my navel, or I'm feeling anxiety all of a sudden. Or heck, one, one time a guy, this was a really weird one, <laughs> but in a cool way. Because I like how it, people experience it differently because they have different psychic uh, modalities as well. Like one time I had a client that was, I, I was sort of still puzzling out what was going on in his field, but I had come to recognize that he had been unconsciously harboring the feeling of being under assault by other people's negative energy and not expressing boundaries or expressing not liking how someone's negativity was working or whatever. So it creates this dynamic where everybody that you perceive as doing you wrong in your life you hold in, hold that into yourself. And then because you're internally holding the vibration of everybody is shitty to me, you keep getting shitty people coming to you in the external. Yeah, <laughs> that's the feel. Your... That's that whole thing the law of attraction was trying to explain to us. And then the we went is, like, though, cool, we can make stuff happen know. we want. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then when, when you don't know that you're holding on to it, that's like where the real, the real magic is at is bringing an awareness to it. So about the time, there is more to it than this. But about the time that I had it like really click and I was like, aha, I had the aha moment of this is where the tangle is. That's this is how, it, what this how is. it's structured. He goes, uh, chance. <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah. Cause he hadn't been talking the whole ses session and he goes, I'm seeing something and it's kind of scary. And it's like, my heart rate is really jumped up. And I was like, this makes sense because I was working in the heart chakra area. Cause that feeling under assault by other people's negative energy, that is a particular zone of the heart chakra. So I was like, just tell me what you're seeing. And he, he didn't know what I was, he didn't even know where I was at in his field. You know, we don't even have cameras on. He's just meditating and, and taking in the tones. But he says that he saw a Medusa like figure, but the head, it was a head that was made of a tangle of snakes. And each of the snakes had the face of somebody from his past that had traumatized him or he felt had done them wrong. Wow. And I was like, that's exactly the type of energy that I'm hitting in this pocket. And so like, um, you know, metaphorically, I, I sliced through it, I cut the knot and it was a big breakthrough session 
for this particular client. He came back later and we moved on to other, you know, <laughs> easier stuff. And he was doing, doing so well and had been doing a lot of work on himself clearly, but that's the type of thing that can happen. It's different for everybody. Sometimes I have a session where we don't speak the whole time. Other times I have a session where there's a lot of affirmations needed where to help move the energy, I need them to say something that constitutes a changed mindset or perspective that helps the energy move because a new belief has been stated. Other times they may need to talk a lot to me because the way that they get the energy to express or come out is to talk, express it through the throat. And other times they might like cry. Other times they might have visionary experiences. Sometimes they might fall asleep. <laughs> it's really <laughs> different for everybody depending on where they're at and what they need and what they're like. But it is an awesome modality. And I feel truly grateful that I was able to discover Eileen Day McCusick's work, who I'll always give all praise and honor to because she's a incredible, incredible innovator in the field and has taught thousands of people to do this. And it is extremely cutting edge and I believe will be very important to the energy medicine of the future. Yeah. And I've had her on my show. You can find a couple episodes oh, cool. on my show from the last couple of years. Yeah, she sounds like the same person. It sounds like the same teachings that I, I know my friend has studied the the tuning fork and uh, there's so many discoveries about the energy body that she's uncovered that are really fascinating. It's like beautiful medicine to find out. And I love the analogy of it being plasma because I definitely feel that when I, I use rattles, you know, and I use uh, tobacco, different medicines like that. And when I'm using the rattle, it's like sound medicine. I can feel stuck areas in different parts of the body, you know, and then clearing that out. It's like, how do I know that it's clear? I don't know. My body jerks a certain way and that's how I know. Like, okay, my body did that. That's clear. That's done. You know, but really this whole process <laughs> is getting into a communication with the body, which has yeah. its own intelligence to it. You know, it actually, you can talk to your body. You can communicate with your body. The reason why this works remotely is because through the ether, we, our bodies are connected because it's the same exact life force energy in my body as it's in yours. The universe is one, but the aspect of the universe that is oneness is life force energy. The life force itself, life is self-existing, life is nature. Now, what is multiple, what is plural, are the vessels and containers for life force energy. But it doesn't matter how far away one vessel is from another, they can talk to each other because it's the same spirit filling each one. So my body talks to your body, even if you're in Australia, <laughs> while we do this tuning process, because my body is in the presence of the tone and the coherence. And I'm, you know, communicating with it mentally by sweep by having this, what you call the language of the biofield anatomy. And your body is made and you've made the agreement as the client that this connection is allowed and is there. And so it is. <laughs> it yeah. Proves that I, distance and uh, separation are purely mental. It's a mental They're purely conceptual. They're not actually real in a sense. There is no, there is no separation and there's no real distance other than mentally. It's really cool because, uh, when I, when I do the healings, like, and I use tobacco, people actually smell the tobacco. Like they're not even here. They're like halfway around the world. They're like, I smell the tobacco. Like, that's because I'm using it right now to clear all your chakras. So it's kind of cool that that way too. They're like, how is that possible? How are you doing that? And I'm like, cause we're. There is no time or separate, it's just like everything you just said, you know, cause we're one and that's how, cause there's no time. That's all just a mental construct. Um, when you really know that that's when it really works. Cause you know it. Yeah. It's real. <laughs> time is real and distance is real, but only mentally real, but everything is mental. <laughs> so the <laughs> mental aspect of it takes precedence over, you know, we can, we can supersede the distance or the time mentally if we are aware that we have that power, but we make time real and we make distance real with our mind and our belief. And the more that you know it, the more it works. Like that's the cool thing. The more you know it to be true, the more that it really has power. So, Absolutely. Uh, well, that's really exciting. So um, you're doing, so you have your Interverse podcast and then you're booking these, is that on your website too, these sessions? Is that how people get in touch with you is through the website for this? Yeah, yeah. If you go to the, my website, interversepodcast.com, there's a shop tab and you can click on the sound healing link. And then on that page, there's more information about the process. And there's even a video 
I did back in the very beginning of January, where I give a more of a presentation, a lot of the same stuff I've talked about now, but maybe in a more orderly fashion with slides and whatnot. And I give a presentation on how it all works. And then in that video, I do a group tune up session. So you can listen to that as many times as you want. And it has the same effect because, like we said, time is mental. It doesn't matter that it's a pre recorded thing. In fact, my most recent client, <laughs> this was amazing. I've never had somebody show up to a session where when I did the dowsing to diagnose the size and, and balance of their chakras, all of them were big, a little bit bigger than normal. <laughs> I was like, you have a powerful energy field and you're in a great state of balance. What have you been doing? <laughs> Usually I don't even tell them what I find in the, the dowsing until after, but I was so blown away. And I knew it was going to be a great session because you're coming in already correct, right? So uh, she told me she'd been doing a lot of singing, a lot of breath work, a lot of meditation, but that for a couple, I don't know if it was a couple of weeks, at least many days, she'd been listening to the group healing session that I ah! made in that video every day. And I was like, wow, that's great to know. <laughs> so I reminded everybody in my channels like, hey, this is available. I don't know if you knew or maybe you were just there when it was live, but still works right now yeah it always works you can always watch the recording listen to things back and they always work that's very cool well this is really exciting new um direction for you in your life and your work chance and your ability to be in service to the collective it's it's very potent uh so the other thing i've been doing for clients too just to tack it on is uh oracle card sessions Oh, nice. I read I Ching and tarot. I combine ah. Eastern and Western Oracle <laughs> styles. And I also maybe sometimes throw in other other types of Oracle decks, but I definitely always use the I Ching as the primary. Is that what that is that you have in your hands right now? Yeah. So I want to tell you that I use the I Ching in the Mesa work, the Andean Mesa work. Alrighty. It is so powerful. So I, you pull? I drew the, this card is called the Cauldron. Ah, it is nice. the fire or the clinging supported by the gentle or breath or wind. So this is the card representing spiritual, uh, spiritual renewal, you know, mastery of self and the rejuvenation of the inner alchemy work. <laughs> so it's pretty cool. It's a, literally, this is about what I'm talking about because this, this is a representation of having a vessel for spirit or your breath that is spiritually powerful and cleansing. Fire is the cleansing element, that is the purifying element, and breath is the spiritual enlivener, if you will. You know, it feeds fire. So this is this is your fire being fed by your breath <laughs> and that you're self-containing that spiritual uh, passionate energy yes. that the cauldron represents and the transformation that comes from building up that that vessel's integrity and continuing to pour in more and more goodness without it leaking out. So that's a great card to pull. That's really cool because that's what we've been talking about the whole time is like having a nice strong container that you can hold all the energy and yeah. radiate it at will <laughs> for your for making the planet a better place. And yeah, um, so if people do a, a sound healing session or an oracle card session, you can do those separately. But what's really cool is to do one and then the other. To start off with the sound healing and then we do cards and the cards will, it's always like hilarious because whatever I say that it was going on in the field and the advice I'll give based on what I find there, then I pull the cards and they're like, yep, this is the double confirmation. Here's a complete repeat with extra insight on everything we just discovered energetically. Yeah, that's beautiful the way that works. It's gorgeous. I love it. So, well, that's awesome, Chance. Thanks for thanks for sharing all that with us. I really appreciate you coming on, and it's great to see you again. It's, it's awesome to see you all charged up, fired up, and like in a new vibe and like high vibe in it, and helping other people do the same. Uh, I assume I'm going to link to your website and your sound healing and your oracle card session. There's lots of free content up on um, on Chance's podcast, so plenty of amazing conversation. Sounds like that. Um, membership thing you got going on is working out too. We're still trying to launch our membership thing over here at Soul Nectar Show, so check us out too. And we're going to give kisses. But before I do, I want to remind you guys, I always say this every single time, please like, subscribe, share, all the things, because that's how the engines know that this is important to you and it might be important to people you know. 
So if you engage, that's how people will find it. Thank you so much for your help in spreading the word. And here we go. Ready to join me, Chance, for some kisses? All right, I'm ready. Let's give kisses, everybody. We'll give, like, Reiki kisses. Okay, here they come, everybody. Mwah. Love you. Love you all. Mwah. Mwah. <laughs> Love you so much, everybody. Mwah. Mwah. And Wonderful. we'll see you next time on Soul Nectar Show. Bye for now. If you found even one gold nugget in this episode of Soul Nectar Show, will you do us a favor? Will you subscribe, like, and share this episode? Maybe even write a comment and let us know what you thought about it. We really, really want to engage with you at a much deeper level. Let's be part of community together. Have a great week, everyone. Bye for now. To dive in deeper to nourishing conversation, visit soulnectar.show. Soul Nectar Show. Awaken all the Nectar Show. Take a soul sip from the drip of the nectar. From the source of who you are.